Welcome to an introduction to economics brought to you by David Hopcroft from Park Bench Tutors. This short podcast forms part of the series on macroeconomics and is about national income and employment. The question that we are trying to investigate is what determines the level of national income and the level of employment in an economy. We are going to look briefly at three approaches to this problem. The first is that of classical economics, the second of Keynesian theory, and finally a look at monetarism. The classical view was that you had flexibility of wages and prices, then you will move towards a position of full employment. The labour market was considered to be the major factor. If wages were low, then firms would employ more. This would increase national income and increase supply. There should be some point where the amount supplied should be in equilibrium with full employment. It should be noted that this does not use the term full employment in the sense of meaning all potential workers are employed. The classical theory allows for a level of unemployment that is voluntary. Demand will take up output until there is full employment, an idea that is expressed in Say's law. The supply of goods and services creates its own demand. Here the labour market is seen to be in equilibrium at a wage of W1 and a level of employment of L1. Here we show total output using different quantities of labour. Note that continually increasing labour eventually will produce smaller and smaller increases in output. This is a very simple way of looking at classical theory. Households gain income from firms in the form of wages and salaries which they spend largely on consumption of goods and services. Some income is not spent on goods and services, this is shown as saving. This is compensated for by investment in firms. The compensation would be determined in part by interest rates. If the demand for loans is high, this pushes interest rates up, increasing savings and reducing inflation. If savings exceed investment, then interest rates fall so investment rises and savings fall. There are three points here upon which the theory hinges. Investment and savings vary with the rate of interest. Wages, prices and interest rates are all flexible. The market is a competitive market. Keynes was an English economist and his work is sent against a background of the Great Depression where it was suggested that firms were losing the incentive to produce as a result of high wages. This is rather oversimplifying, but clearly the classical theory seemed to be missing something. Keynes argued the following points needed consideration. The level of savings depended upon the level of national income and was not greatly influenced by interest rates. The level of investment will depend upon the expectations and confidence of business as well as interest rates. Monopolies will make prices less flexible and aggregate demand may not be sufficient to give full employment. So how did Keynes suggest we look at things? What are his proposals? The simplest way of looking at this is to say that the classical view is that supply creates its own demand, while Keynes' view is that demand determines how much is supplied. The central point of Keynes then becomes that there will be a level of national income where aggregate demand is equal to the total value of production. The Keynes model makes a number of assumptions. First, and probably the most important, this is a short-run model. This is one reason why it has been criticised. It assumes wages and prices are fixed. This means producers respond to changes in demand by changing the quantity produced rather than by changing price. The money market, meaning interest rates here, is ignored. The assumption is that consumption and savings are both directly related to income. The graph assumes the relationships are linear. The greater the income, then the greater the consumption and the greater the amount that is saved by a household. The slope of these lines is important. The slope represents the increase per monetary unit of income, dollars, pounds, euros or whatever is being used. The slope for consumption is called the marginal propensity to consume. It is the extra consumption that occurs for each individual monetary unit of income. The slope for saving is called the marginal propensity to save. It is the extra saving that will result from each additional monetary unit of income. 
The next assumption is that investment and government spending are independent of income changes. Government spending is then seen as being determined by government policy and business investment in the short term by business expectations. So if it is considered independent of national income, then both can be represented as straight lines. A change in income will not produce a change in government spending or an investment. Further assumptions were that taxation would be considered in the form of a lump sum, which probably oversimplifies but makes the model easier to follow. Exports were considered to be independent of income, so they can be represented by a straight line. Imports were seen as being dependent upon income. The higher the national income, the greater the import of goods and services. What is now needed for equilibrium? We defined earlier that at the equilibrium point, aggregate demand was equal to the total value of all goods and services produced. The measure of goods and services produced that we can use here is national income. So aggregate demand AD equals national income Y at equilibrium. Since aggregate demand AD equals national income Y at equilibrium, we can say that aggregate demand is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports. And that national income is equal to consumption plus savings plus tax. We can get rid of the C for consumption here. We can now say that investment plus government spending plus exports minus imports equals savings plus tax. So we rearrange, get M on the other side. Investment plus government spending plus exports equals savings plus tax plus imports. What we have done is to separate the flows of income in terms of injections and withdrawals. Investment, government spending and exports are injections. Savings, taxes and imports are withdrawals, W. So at equilibrium, injections equals withdrawals, J equals W. The assumptions here are that all injections are autonomous. So if we graph these, then injections should be a horizontal straight line if they are independent of income. Withdrawals such as savings and imports are dependent on income and so we expect an upward sloping line. The more income, the greater the savings and the greater the imports. The slope of the withdrawals line will be the sum of the slopes of the marginal propensity to save and the marginal propensity to import. So the slope of W equals MPS plus MPM. Here is that mapped out as a graph. The equilibrium level of income is represented here by YE. Total withdrawals, total injections and aggregate demand together are represented by the 45 degree line. Where the aggregate demand line meets the 45 degree line and where the withdrawals and, in withdrawals and injection lines intersect, are both points where we can measure the equilibrium level of income. Let us just recap here. There are two ways of identifying the equilibrium level of income. The first is where the aggregate demand line intersects with the 45 degree line, and the second where withdrawals and injections will intersect. Remember, YE is the equilibrium level of income. At income levels other than YE, the economic forces will push the economy back to equilibrium. If production exceeds demand, then production is cut back. If demand exceeds income, then production is increased. A key to understanding the popularity of Keynes' theory for politics is the multiplier effect. If an investment of, say, $4 million is injected and $3 million is spent on goods and imports, then national income will rise. Not immediately, but will over future years. So the rise in national income increases consumption in future years by successively smaller amounts. Essentially, if we shift injections through investment, we move the injection line from J to J dashed, and the point for YE shifts now to the right as national income is increased. So the change in income is represented by delta Y, the change in the investment by delta I. The slope of the withdrawal line represented the sum of the marginal propensity to save and the marginal propensity to import. So delta I divided by delta Y equals MPS plus MPM. So delta Y equals delta I divided by MPS plus MPM. 
The multiplier is determined by 1 divided by MPS plus MPM, assuming taxes are lump sums. The multiplier operates whether the change is through investment, government spending, exports or consumption. We've only just shown this for investment. If we import more from country X, then that country may more buy more from the UK, which will increase our exports. This is what we mean by foreign repercussions. What happens if taxes are raised? The withdrawal line now shifts from W to W dashed, and the value for YE moves to Y dashed E. In other words, the equilibrium level for income is being reduced. Now remember that disposable national income is equal to national income less taxes taken, so raising taxes will reduce disposable national income. Delta T is equal to delta Y disposable. The change in withdrawals is given by delta W equals delta T minus the sum of MPS plus MPM divided by delta T. So delta W is equal to MPC delta T. We can also calculate delta Y as negative delta W divided by MPS plus MPM, and Y as being negative de MPC delta T divided by MPS plus MPM. Now, let's get to the important idea. If we increase government spending by X, it produces an increase in national income of more than X. If we increase taxation by X, then it also produces a reduction in national income. But the reduction in national income from taxation is smaller than the increase in national income from increasing government spending. This assumes all the tax is spent. So if we increase taxation and increase government spending by the same amount, there should be an overall increase in national income. You've probably spotted the idea that government intervention can then be used to change the economy in the short run. If the full employment level of income is YF and the current point is YE, then there is not full employment. We say that there is a deflationary gap. Governments can now alter track. We say they are making a change in their fiscal policy. This may increase government spending or reduce taxes. If the equilibrium level is above the full employment level, then it cannot be attained. We say that there is an inflationary gap. If the economy is at a full employment level, then prices are forced upwards. The change in fiscal policy options include cutting government spending and raising taxes. There are two immediate points to note about Keynes' theory. The first is that it tends to produce stop-go economies, so long-term planning and growth become harder to achieve. The second is that it fails to really consider inflation. The 1970s saw both high unemployment and high inflation at the same time. Several alternative theories criticize Keynes' theory. These will be considered in more detail later. Among them are monetarists who argue that short-term management does more harm than good, that there is a relationship between money supply and income over the long term, and that there is a natural level of unemployment which would be found without any government intervention. This ends our podcast on national income and employment, brought to you by Park Bench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. For more information about Park Bench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.